Um, for those of you in the back, there are, there's still some seats in the way back for you guys that are standing up. Um, so I don't want you to be uncomfortable. For those of you just coming in, there there are still some seats you'll find kind of in the corners the way back. There are a couple spots. Make yourselves at home. I think we're going to get started. I have one question. Is there anyone from New Media in, in the audience? This was, uh, this highly anticipated presentation uh, was billed on the schedule as Lullabot slash New Media doubleheader. So I'm very impressed that you all found us. Um, we are actually going to talk about uh, what went into the making of sci-fi.com, the new sci-fi.com on Drupal. Um, and so thanks for all of you lovely folks for showing up. Uh, first, though, from the Department of Shameless Self-Promotion, um, this actually is sort of our, our commercial spot. Uh, Lullabot is a, I don't want to say this wrong because I'll lose my job. It's either diamond or platinum. I'm going to go with platinum sponsor. Whew, okay. Um, so we're just going to do sort of a quick... Uh, about us video that kind of tells you a little bit about who we are. Um, this was shot at our team retreat in November. We all gathered together in Palm Springs. Uh, Lullabot is a distributed company, so everyone works from wherever they live. Um, we're distributed from as far east as Madrid and Copenhagen to as far west as Los Angeles and Portland and uh, San Francisco. So. We're spread out all over the world, and we get together uh, as a team once a year. And uh, so this is a little, a little ditty we shot at our last gathering. Whenever there's a lot of people in a market and there's a race to the bottom in terms of cost, the only way you can, you can sustainably keep cutting costs is, to, is by cutting corners and sacrificing craftsmanship. Our society seems to sort of value cheap Quick. The obsession with efficiency and deadlines and timelines and costs. Cost, time. Let's all just get going. Well, you know, our biggest goal is to just get you to sign a contract. It's a numbers thing. It's throw numbers at the problem. Throw more bodies. More bodies means faster time. Meet specs. It's done. I've worked at a couple other places where people who were actually doing the work didn't talk to the clients. There was always the business person whose job was to say something to the client. A lot of companies just start with the goal of business, uh, to make money, to hire people. Um, but we kind of started with a higher goal of uh, invention. When you start a company, the second thing you do is rent an office. Uh, we didn't do that. They knew they wanted to have talented people who were deeply invested in the Drupal community, but those people lived all over the place. We're in Ecuador, Spain, uh, the UK, Canada, the US. They converged on this, this model from the Drupal community and from the open source projects that preceded it uh, of distributed work. On the surface of it, the thing that makes the lullab Lullabot the most unique is the fact that we're a distributed company. Everybody um, works from home or from their local public library or coffee shop. You start the day fresh, and if you didn't, you stop. I mean, you know, so, so you go in refreshed, you are with a team that is all very happy as well, so you're not dealing with the same politics. Trust is big within our team because we're hiring people and telling them we're not going to watch you every second of the day. It's the discipline to find people that stand out enough to, to, to stand out across distance. I often say that the work that we do, what you get out of it as a byproduct is a website. The real thing that you get is someone that understands your business. Yeah, you need a website, but why? Websites can seem like a commodity on the surface, but they're doing some critical function within your business. They are interacting with humans. Every software project is different, and it's really hard to reduce any one software project down to a formula. 
book our people 100% on a single project. So there's no jumping from one project to another and trying to get their head back in code that they haven't touched in a week. It's not where you're hopping and doing something and hopping and doing You're really focusing. And so, yeah, when you sit down for two hours, you are getting a lot done. It's explosive. I don't feel like a cog in a machine that just needs to, like, do this task over and over and over again for no purpose. There's a purpose to what I'm doing, and as part of this larger picture, the sum is greater than its parts. When the people who are part of the company are really valued as individuals, not just interchangeable units of billable hours. You can really tell in the decisions that get made. I've seen this over and over on projects that I've been on where we go in and it's a client that's operated in a more traditional way. And by the time we leave, they have kind of adopted a lot of the things that we do um, because they found how well they work. In order to engage deeply with your work, you have to be able to find intrinsic value in the work itself and not just the end product. Is the work that you're doing shareable? Is it something that you want to pass on? One of the greatest tools of a designer is just fascination. Like, people who are just sort of fascinated with, wait a minute, how does that actually work? Like, what happened? How does that get on the page? Like, who does that? You can't innovate if you're not willing to take chances and make mistakes and figure out what works. And the fact that that's encouraged and embraced and supported at Lullabot means that the opportunities and potential is, is like 10 times more than any place I've ever been. I secretly always wanted to be a lullaby because I, I saw how much fun they had. You know, I saw how they weren't just doing the same thing as every other company um, and they were actually enjoying the work that they did. A lot of that stuff early on just sort of felt like magic and we liked that feeling of, of, of magic. But as we as we kept growing and explaining to new people who came on like, okay, this is, this is how we create the magic. This is how we create the magic. We started to realize, actually, it wasn't so much magic. It was the values that made us, us. Lullabot's core values. I know. Collaborate openly. Hold on. Be human. I got it, I got it. Um, I think it's... Is it six? Inspire and empower. Have fun. Invent and innovate. Kick ass. Uh, that might be it. And kick ass. Our clients come to us because they ultimately want to take what they do and put that in front of other people. And when you start to think of that in that context, it becomes really important work. Innovation is such a funny word in Silicon Valley, but I, I really feel like our innovation comes from trying to, to create new systems, new ways of being, new ways of working, new ways of connecting. And it's an experiment, and sometimes we fail. But when it works, that's innovation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's okay, thank you, thank you. Stop, stop the applause. Um, so uh, anyway, that's a little bit about us. Um, we're very grateful that you came out to uh, hear a little bit more about Lullabot. And, and now we're going to talk about, uh, well, let me introduce us first. Um, Mike, you want to, let's just go from left to right here, do a quick introduction. I'm Mike Hirsch. I'm Mike Herschel. I was the lead front-end developer on the project. Jeff Vargas, I'm the director of technology for Sci-Fi. I'm Helena Zubkow, I was another front-end developer on the project. My name is Seth Brown, um, I'm Lullabot COO, and I had the great pleasure of actually being the project manager on this project, directly. I'm Chris Albrecht, and I was the lead back-end developer on the project. Awesome, so I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff to talk a little bit about the inception, see how I'm using Sci-Fi words, the inception of this project. Thanks everyone for coming out. Um, I think I can sum down, sum up, summarize what we were looking to do um, with just one simple point. We uh, at SciFi.com had a website that went back to 2009, so it was a legacy Drupal instance that had been dated. What we were looking to achieve was to have a website that did not suck, and the way that we needed to do that was to go to a responsive site, use, really use the imagery that we had a lot better. Uh, and then focus on a great 
video experience. Um, the video player that we had was a little bit outdated. Um, it was a little difficult to work with, and it was also flash-based, so there was no way we can get it to work on mobile. Uh, and for mobile in and of itself, we had a separate M. Sci-Fi site that was actually a whole other content management system in and of itself. Um, it sort of sucked down content through feeds from our site, but there was still some manual manipulation that we had to do uh, almost on a weekly basis to get it to work. Um, we were not exactly uh, wholly Drupal on the legacy site. It was actually Smarty templates on the front end. So we had two different things we had to work with, two different systems, um, not even counting the mobile the mobile site. Um, we also had a legacy server, and the legacy server was not Drupal at all, it was just PHP and MySQL, and we still needed it for things like running the schedule. So we had a very um, disjointed experience, and to add to the disjointed experience, if you wanted to watch full episodes on the site, you had to go to sci-fi.com slash now. That was a totally separate site. Um, it was also Drupal, but it wasn't managed by us, it was managed by a central group within NBC. So it looked similar to sci-fi.com, but the theming wasn't quite the same. Um, once we had the ability to actually merge full episodes into our sites, if we so chose, that's what we decided we wanted to do. We wanted to build a responsive site. We wanted to get um, a very responsive player that looked great, and we wanted to have a mobile site that did not have a separate interface altogether. Um, to that end, you know, we discussed a lot of these things with Lullabot um, about how we wanted to approach it, and um, we looked at our, our peers at NBC Universal, seeing what they were doing with their project. Um, we were, I think, one of the only ones that were still on the legacy platform, so in addition to building out a new fresh face, we actually had to handle the content migration, so that was, uh, that was definitely a task in and of itself that uh, wasn't pretty, but it got done, and uh, it really helped us keep the same look and feel, keep the content fresh, um, and just present things in a brand new way that really makes you want to go to the site, click around, makes you want to interact with it. Um, just pass on to. Well, we're gonna do a we're gonna do one more do a quick video here that's kind of about the project um, in the words of our client. We know you guys like video, or you wouldn't be here for the sci-fi.com presentation. Prior to Lullabot coming in and working with us, SciFi.com's website was very much outdated. It was not responsive. It was difficult to program. There were a lot of customizations that essentially are hacks. Clunky. It lacked any sort of flexibility. And a lot of things, you know, were put together with duct tape and bailing wire. It didn't feel like a good showcase for a network that's doing new and innovative things. The channel started in 92. Uh, like any other basic cable channel, you know, had very little original programming, a lot of licensed stuff. You're watching the Starlast on the Sci-Fi Channel. And over the years, it's evolved to, you know, have a lot of original programming, you know, most notably Battlestar Galactica a few years ago, and now we've got uh, Haven, Helix, and 12 Monkeys. These shows are all about building these incredible worlds, and we can let people go even deeper with additional platforms. So say we all. So say we all. So say we all. We all have that uncle or family member who has, like, a 1980. Chevy Nova, they don't want to let go of. And then you have that uncle that has the really nice, sleek BMW convertible. Prior to the new site, we had a lot of issues. I mean, one was that the site was on a, on a very old back end that admittedly very few people within the organization still understood all the ins and outs of. It was, it was quite old. If you had come to sci-fi.com before and you wanted to watch a full episode, you would go to sci-fi.com slash now, which was actually a separate website altogether. And what we said is we, we no longer want to have two separate experiences. So we took two different websites and we merged them together. We ended up using a local company to help us with the front-end design, a company called Work & Co. And they were really great at helping us to conceptualize and get the creative front-end done. While we were doing that, Lullabot in parallel was helping with a lot of the back-end migration. We were able to really stitch all of this together in a way that is not only easy for us to maintain, but is a lot more meaningful for uh, our site visitors and, and, and fans of the network. We provide a really unique, elegant, 
full episode experience for our users. We've got a new player that's scalable, so you can scale your browser window to get the player any size you want. It lets us present the shows in a more cinematic way. You know, the site just, it just looks better, and everything just, we can really showcase how gorgeous a lot of these shows are. If the fans had a really unique perspective, or there was a fan that made a really great point, we could showcase that point, but whether it be a tweet or an Instagram photo on the homepage of sci-fi.com. Updating the site now has, has gotten a lot easier. In our previous CMS, we had to go to over here to find one thing and do this over here and this over here. Now it's collected into a much easier interface to use. And it's given our content people more time to actually make great content and not wrestle with actually getting it on the site. Once you start putting code and pixels together and the site actually starts working, there's always a lot of questions. Even though you, you know, Lullabot is a distributed company and they're sort of all over the world, there is always someone available to talk to. We move at an extremely fast pace here. It's 360 miles an hour all the time and Lullabot was able to come right in and fit right in. Get on our pace, get on our schedule, speak our language. There were a few instances, even when we were getting really close to launch, down to the wire, and we were worried about sort of getting all the fit and finish done in time for the launch, that we would wake up the next morning and see a couple of things that we hadn't even caught that were actually getting fixed on the side because there was definitely a level of pride and work to make sure that the site sung as loudly as we wanted it to. So the site launch in January, you always sort of hold your breath when you flick that switch that morning and everything was really working right out of the gate. We left one day with an old website and we came in the next day with a brand new pretty website and it worked. I think the new sci-fi.com is one of the best television websites that's out there right now. I think it serves our content in a way that is unique to us. It makes it feel big and aspirational. It looks and works so well. Uh, and it's finally sort of up to the quality of, of a lot of the other things we've been doing in the digital space over the years. The redesign has impacted my job in two distinct ways. On the back end, the workflow has improved, so the time that it took to get something done before is less. On the front end of things, because we have a whole new interface and a new beautiful way of presenting content, this makes me think of the things that we can do for our shows and the digital extensions of our shows in totally new ways. Now that the design has improved exponentially, the ideas that I can come up with or my colleagues can come up with have expanded. We have three more videos. <laughs> <laughs> so Mike's going to talk a little bit about the front end challenges that we went through with this site and, and give us a quick tour. And then Chris is going to talk a little bit uh, about the back end. And we'll see how much time we have left there because uh, New Media, New Media, if you're in the house, they have the, uh, the next half hour. So. All right, so Matt Kruger said um, on that video that it's the best <coughs> website ever. And he's, he's right because I, I personally think the website kicks ass. It's, there's so much cool stuff going on here. And I'm going to get a little bit excited about it because it's, it's really cool. Um, <coughs> so the first thing you're going to see wh as, as you scroll up and down is, is the crazy scroll interactions. So if, if you look, you see how in the top there's a latest episodes view and everything's kind of moving down and fading around and it's all binded to the scroll event. So as you scroll up, the opacity changes and it, the heroes transform in and out. So there's going to be anywhere between one and three heroes. We ha below that we have what's called the what we call the tile feed. So so the tile feed is fully responsive. Um, it'll cycle between one and three columns. Um, it does this really cool ad reveal. You see that ad reveal reveal at the bottom right there? It's pretty slick. Just just in case you guys don't know this, it's pretty cool. So you go down, you have a footer. Right now it's doing uh, infinite uh, views, infinite load more, or infinite scroll, or whatever it is. Um, so we have a, a pretty cool schedule page. You can see right now we have Ginger Snaps 2 live on Sci-Fi right now. Um, there's, we have, you know, a uh, time zone picker, date picker, all that cool stuff. We have a concept of a show microsite in here. So each, well not each show, but most of the shows have their own navigation. 
at the top right up here. And um, if you go in here, they're, they're also they also have their own color scheme. So you can see that these hyperlinks are blue. And if we go into the recap right here, you're going to see some of the highlights are blue. Those are being injected through like a style tag and tag in the head. So out of the audience right here, do we have any front end developers? Some cheers. Sweet. <coughs> what about uh, back end developers? All right. Everybody else. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, the the front end, and then Seth, when my time is up, he's going to make it sound like an injured llama, just so to kind of let me know. So one of the one of the main challenges for me is for me was making everything really performant. We had um, partially functioning mocks from the design agency uh, Working Co, but. The mocks were animating through uh, animating like the top, the CSS top values, and margins and stuff like that. Now, when you're when you're animating stuff, when you're animating stuff, you want to use transform CSS transforms. What it does is when you're using transforms, it's not affecting um, the elements around it. So what that means is if if I'm moving something normally, the browser has to recalculate everything below that. You know, so it knows where to fit stuff. But if you're using transforms, it does it independently, and you can also promote those up into the own in, into its own layers. So, as as the browser is rendering the web page, it's going to render the the HTML, the CSS, combine them into what's called the render tree, and at that point, it's going to start painting the page. In a perfect world, you want to paint that page one time. But the thing about it is, on a website like this, which is like it's a really heavy website, you know, there's a whole bunch of images and cool stuff going on, it wants to repaint everything because because we're moving stuff around on top of each other and, and, anim and animating opacity and stuff. So the trick is minimizing those repaints. So what we're doing is we're promoting everything into its own layer. So you can do that in a couple different ways. There's like a CSS will change property. It's not supported across all browsers. We're using a backface visibility property, which is kind of a CSS hack, but it works really well. Um, what that does is it promotes everything into its own layer. So if you're familiar with uh, image processing or, or Im image editing programs like Photoshop, where you have everything on its own layer, you can move those. You can move the items around independently on their layers, and so what happens is all the browser has to worry about is com what's called compositing. And compositing is just drawing the pixels to the spray to the uh, screen. That's done on your computer's graphics, the GPU, which is a lot quicker. So there's a lot of like cool technical stuff that's complicated, but I, I'm, I'm passionate about it. I, th I think that's pretty cool. Um, it's fully responsive. Let me kind of show, sh show you guys how it's responsive here. Let's move it over. So as we get narrow, you can see everything is a uh, kind of kind of just does what it, wh what it, what it should do. The, um, the heroes will transition to a carousel, flex sl slider based carousel. And the reason that it does that is that these scroll events and touch move events will not work properly on mobile because uh, most mobile browsers will attempt to pause any type of animation as you scroll. So if you pause the animation while you're scrolling, you scroll down, everything's going to be jumpy and it's really going to suck. So what we end up doing is we're using uh, JavaScript uh, user agent detection. And we're also, we also have it set so if you go below 650 pixels, it'll load this flex slider. And um, you can see the... <coughs> the uh, tile feed will go ahead and you know collapse into one column. Everything like that just works pretty well. It has a you know cool search functionality. Has awesome accessibility thanks to Helena and uh, Chris. And um, gosh, I don't even know what to talk about. There's so much stuff. Oh, Packery. So we're using a um, we're using a jQuery plugin called Packery to handle all of the tile feed. Let me refresh this one more time here. So what if, if you look at the tile feed, you're going to see a couple different things. You're going to see that um, there's some double width tiles right around here. I'm putting up my screen so you guys can see exactly, right? So I'm, I'm putting up my screen. <laughs> and you can also see up, up here there's some half height tiles. And so the trick is to get everything to line up properly, you know? And like, what are we going to do if there's an odd number of half height tiles? You know, to tell you the truth, what we do is we end up duplicating a tile. So we, because we obviously need an even number, we have a whole bunch of cool JavaScript that kind of stacks everything together, and we, 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 we're leveraging the Packery plugin to push everything together. It works really well. 
Um, just to continue on the tour of the site, we also have the ability to sign into your local cable pro cable provider. Once you do that, um, let's do that. We can try to do that, but that might be out of scope. We don't have too much time. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I think that might be my my signal. Who's next? All right. We'll look a little bit really quick at the back end as well, I think. But no, this is, I mean, yeah. it's pretty, so I, I just get excited it's pretty thrilling. <laughs> Was that a, a, a good llama impression? That was exactly what I expected. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. So everyone caught everything that Mike said, right? All written down? There'll be a test later. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the front end is definitely the, the best part about this site. Mike did an, some amazing work in here. Uh, some of the tricks to the back end were trying to get a lot of the architecture to work together. I'm going to try and get back to the right dang Chrome tab here that I'm logged into. Um, so in terms of the back end architecture, we have a lot of, a lot of our content is fed in through feeds from services like, uh, there's one called TVE, Television Everywhere, that gives you TV show programming. Uh, with full recaps, it's all managed in a separate database. That ties into a TV show. That all comes in from a separate source. And then we have our content team, or Jeff's content team, adding in pieces to really round it all out, adding in the right uh, images to override what might be coming in from the feed, or to add in character bios, profiles, to augment what's already coming in. But most of this data is coming in from multiple separate sources. So the first thing we had to do was try and architect this system to make it easy to find the right piece of content you're looking for when it's all related to a separate piece of content that's coming from a separate source. So you've got a TV show that has separate episodes that might not have aired yet, you can't watch them yet, but they have a recap with a textual description of it. Then there are seasons for that TV show. Certain characters appear on certain season, uh, seasons. Getting myself tied up. And then you've got character actors playing those characters and it's it can become a really big tangled mess to try and show everything in the right place and get that data in a contextual nature to come together and form the right title. What uh, character are you looking at? What show do they belong to? What season do they appear in? So the big challenge that for us was, you know, we have a good homepage here, which is a view of a number of different pieces of content from throughout the site, episodes, teasers, photo galleries, all sorts of things like that. But then when you get into the TV show microsite level is where we have a little bit of complexity. So that's what I'd like to talk about. We'll use Bitten as an example. So when you get into the TV show, as Mike was showing, we have a separate menu for the TV show. Ooh, I don't want to log in yet. So, and it's going to be hidden here by my admin toolbar, but if we jump back to the original one, that would still show on the side. You have your main site menu now hidden off to the side back to the TV show, you have a cast and info page, videos for that TV show, separate photo gallery, browse through each episode. And then each TV show has the ability to add custom pieces at the end if they have their own blog or we gave them the ability to create certain TV show specific external sites. Like, uh, let's wait to see where this is going to go because they've added a lot since we've worked on it. But they actually live in a separate place, and we allow them to link it in and sort of use some of the same branding to piece it all together and make it look like one seamless environment. So this is, <laughs> yeah, let's load a flash site on this internet. Uh, go back. So the piece I really wanted to show off here is we're using panels for every single page. Uh, we are big proponents of using panels to use content panes to lay out everything. When you start doing things like putting things in a views page or in a menu callback, you start to lose track of things. You get up with a spaghetti architecture and it's really hard for the next team to come in and pick up where you left off. And in the end, that's what we did. When Lullabot left, Jeff's team had to take over and run everything after we had stepped out the door. So we wanted to make it as easy for them to find things and customize things as possible. And Panels gives you that extra boost of the context awareness of where it is in the site, who's looking at it, what particular TV show you're looking at. It can take all that data and feed it through into things like views to get some really, really rich uh, displays out of it. And I had an admin screen before. What happened to it? Oh, no, you might have to log in for me again, Jeff. Oh, it switched off, yeah.
ta-da, here we go. So the panels, the meat and potatoes, this is my favorite part. I'm kind of a panels junkie. So every single page that we use is laid out in panels. If you go to a place on the website, you can go to a panel to find it. So some of the really fun ones to do were to try and get the cast pages and the cast member bios to line up with the right TV show in the right season, because you have TV shows where certain cast members only appear in certain seasons. So if we look at, let's go to videos, cast, here we go. We really leveraged a lot of what we can do with the relationships in, con in panels. Uh, call these contexts here, not to be confused with the context module, which is the disclaimer you always have to give when talking about panels context. You see there's a lot of pieces all put together in here about the node that's coming in and then you can relate that to any other field on that particular piece of content. And you can see with the feeds that we're bringing in, there are a huge number of extra fields in here for all sorts of metadata about these TV shows. And then find your way to the season, to the right char uh, character and cast member. Let's see if I can pull out another one here. Go to episodes. And if you have Obviously, you can see here a couple of different variants with each panels page to link these pieces together. And that was able to give us this show micro site. I'll jump back into this one. Where each show has seemingly its own primary navigation. Even though the regular main menu for the site is still hidden off to the side. Each one is unique, has a unique URL. But using panels and that relationship with the context, we're able to tie it all into one thing. And having that sort of structure, having it all in panels, having the same views and content panes that we were able to reuse over and over again in different parts of the site, really trimmed down the amount of development time we needed. Any other developer could come in and really easily pick it up because we were using the same patterns and the same systems. Um, how much time? Oh, I didn't plan that. How much time do I have, Lama? A minute, A minute or two? All right. The other piece I wanted to talk about was the way we had to integrate videos and uh, this fun little thing that we all love, prove that you paid some big company a whole ton of money to go watch the TV shows. So you can watch an incredible amount of videos on this website for free, which will not load on this internet connection, I'm quite sure. You can see it's still trying. Uh, and there's even some full episodes you can watch for free. It depends on the licensing, but we had to figure out how to get that all to play in the right video players because they come from different sources and they're licensed by different companies. And then also figure out a way to get the authentication piece to jump on here so that you can watch full episodes on the website. And one piece we didn't even talk about that goes along with that, you can watch live, let's go back to the home page. We even have a separate video player that you could watch whatever's happening on sci-fi.com live on your computer right now. And it does require you to authenticate the same way the other videos do. Uh, but that was, I want to give all the credit to one of our contractors, Mike Bailey, who figured these pieces out. He had a Christmas miracle and actually got the videos all working on all devices that would support them at like 4 a.m. on Christmas Eve, right before one of our deadlines. And that was, uh, it was a trick because we had to deal with things like Flash. If some videos were being fed in only through a Flash player, we had to figure out if there was an alternative so we weren't relying on Flash or these authentication pieces using Adobe Pass to authenticate you to your cable provider and then bring you back to the website and store the tokens the right way. And then what happens if you're on a mobile device, like an Apple device that doesn't support Flash? So we had to try and bring all those pieces together to create that one seamless video experience. And uh, the end result, I think, Helen, are you gonna talk a little bit about the deep linking in the app? Or do you want me to talk about that? Right, okay, I'll go for that then. And so this was a really cool piece that we ended up doing. To watch a full episode on your phone can be done, you just can't do it through sci-fi.com's website, at least for most full episodes. Some of them are free, but most of them require you to be authenticated. So we have a system in place for deep linking into a mobile app called Sci-Fi Now. So if you go to that on your phone, and I'm not sure, do we have an Android version yet? Or do you, has there been one? I don't know, I haven't checked <laughs> in a while. It's, it's um, no. eventually. It's an iOS, it's an it's iOS only app. Coming soon. Um, so for iOS at least, when you go to one of those pages, it'll have a little banner at the top like you see if you try and go to Twitter or anything like that. We have an app, go get our app. 
If you have that app installed and you try and play that video, it will actually bring up the app, take you into that app, and start playing that particular video or episode instantly. And it creates almost a seamless transition that unless you're you know, watching for the whole slide across thing that Apple does, you wouldn't even know what's happening. And then you have that video playing through the app, which then reduces the lag of going through a, a browser to watch the video. Uh, but it's a very cool system. We have that all work together with each different video, so it can deep link you right into that particular section of the app. It's not like, here's the sci-fi app now, figure out the navigation, go through here, click a bunch of buttons, go find the video you're just looking for. Takes you in and starts playing all the way. And to clarify, uh, the reason why we have to have the app is is for uh, legal purposes. So since there's no DRM through that mobile video player, we have to push you through to the mobile app. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. We had to actually, during the process, scale back the capabilities of the video player we were using due to the legal and, and DRM issues. Um, it's an HTML5 player. It's responsive. Um, it's it's a beautiful uh, b video experience in general, but uh, pulling it together, this is kind of the, the, the story of the project. Um, we were tasked, when, when we took on the project, we were told that video was a solved problem. Like that, oh yeah, you know, sci-fi already has a website, it plays video, that, that's gonna work great for you. And we had a big delay during the design phase of the project where the designs were happening. And it was sort of just lining up the right vendor and then approving the designs. This is something that happens to all of us, I'm sure, on, on our projects. And by the time that the designs were approved and we were ready to go again, when we got the green light to resume the project, uh, NBC ONTS, which is the technology group, had deprecated the video uh, system that we were using, uh, which was an older version of, of MPX. It, it used a, a different architecture within Drupal to connect videos to shows to you know episodes and all that sort of thing. So we we had to get a new player working with a n and then we were given sort of three different options for how to implement uh, video. We used a company called the platform or NBC does uh, and and their their video system is called MPX, right? And uh, so we these the options weren't very well documented. Nobody had put them into practice yet at the time, and uh, we ended up burning a lot of of developer weeks, uh, culminating in sort of a three week long development uh, sprint by one individual this, who was mentioned earlier uh, that literally did finish on Christmas Eve at 4 a.m. At which point I was of course asleep and received a text that all it said was the baby Jesus does love us. <laughs> that was that was what I woke up to at 4 a.m. on Christmas Eve morning, and believe it or not, I was actually so happy to be woken up by that message because uh, Jeff's boss Matthew was asking me pretty much every day, like, "Are we going to be able to make this timeline?" And we were sort of saying, "Well, we have a beautiful site. It's everything's working. It's responsive. The design is fantastic. Advertising there, the analysts, but we don't have any video." And uh, apparently, that's a problem if you're trying to launch a video site. So. Anyway, we, uh, we had a very near thing um, getting our site launched uh, on January 5th, was it, what was it, 6th, yeah, so. 30 seconds. Anyway, good times. So we should probably wind down, do you have any? No, I'm just pushing buttons on the screen. Yeah, let's open it up to questions. I mean, these I don't, I'm never sure why these projects are interesting to y'all. Whether it's you know how do the, how do big projects like this happen, the technology, the project management, um, we'd be happy to field any questions. Yeah, absolutely. Hi guys, uh, I'm wondering uh, for the front end. Uh, it's very um, very very heavy with the parallax stuff you got going on, all of that uh, with images and video. And have you taken a look at? Um, developing countries and sort of people who have uh, older hardware systems and maybe not fast enough internet, do you give them a, a different experience? So the site supports down to Internet Explorer 9. Um, internet, which actually, Internet Explorer actually hardware accelerates the animation, which makes them pretty smooth. Um, the answer is pretty much no. There is a Sci-Fi International site, so I know there's there's a different Sci-Fi Europe site. And yeah, and there's, and there's restrictions. So in terms of getting Sci-Fi.com content, 
depending on where you are, you can't get some of our content if you're not within the U.S. But you can go to one of the um, international sites for what they offer. So it's uh, strictly mostly licensing. So you guys don't manage those other sites in other countries? No. Wow. That all being said, I put a lot of work into trying to make everything just as much as uh, as, mo as performant as possible for, like I always joke, my, wa my mom's Windows Millennium machine. <laughs> you know, um, will will it work on that? And you know, the answer is yes. It's, it's, it is a little choppy, but she can get what she needs. So, <laughs> thank you. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, so I'm Joanna. I'm from NBC, and I'm working on Telemundo.com, which is I think the second greatest television website. <laughs> 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 um, and we are also heavily panel views. Very, that's our whole back end, basically. And we are coming up against some performance issues with that. Um, we're about to start doing a bunch of refactoring, and I thought, before we deep dive into that, I thought maybe you could comment, or did you find yourself having performance issues, or were you kind of smooth sailing, or? Yeah, um, I think when you're using panels and views, there's always gonna be, well, in general, you're gonna have performance issues when you start combining that much data and doing those sorts of database queries, especially when you're joining so many different pieces together like we were to get you know, TV shows, characters, et cetera. So the things to look into there, we and we didn't talk about this at all, we have two uh, caching layers that sit on top of this website. We have a varnish cache and an Akamai cache. Yeah, so the, the, here's the hardest part, and I just, if you have, guys haven't listened to this, go find Winlears and um, Fabian Franz talking about Drupal 8 caching. It's gonna be absolutely amazing, but they talk about what the deficits are in seven. So here's the problem is that you can get around a lot of that stuff. This site runs so fast when you have a decent internet connection. <laughs> now, nothing against you, this is actually loading really fast here, honestly. Um, but when you have to start clearing caches, you run into these performance issues just because of the nature of the data and how many users and traffic coming through it. So you can do things like turning on your views caching to try and get at least the, the queries cached. That will save you some performance time so it's not rebuilding the query each time. And depending on what they are, you can also cache the the resulting data. So that can give you a little bit of a boost if you're you know, rebuilding your caches. Uh, panels does have the ability, I believe, to do caching at the individual pane level. So there are different tricks here and there to kind of to help that along. And then there are modules like the expired module, which works with Akamai and Varnish to give you a little bit more control over which pages of the site get cleared when something changes. So for example, if you update a TV show then you need to expire that TV shows page and you need to expire the home page where that TV show might show up as a tile. So there's ways that you can try and make that a little bit more efficient so things are expiring and being rebuilt in the right order. But honestly, when it comes down to sites like that where you have a heavy load um, with a lot of media, a lot of database calls, heavy database, it's, it's tricky to try and get around it in Drupal 7. So that's, those are the tricks that we use to try and, uh, and keep that to a minimum. Uh, the, cache time reloads at least. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Chris, do we do any actual like slow query tuning of our own, like where we were actually rewriting views queries or anything of that nature? Not, in, or uh, using no, stored really. procedures? No. Okay. Well, um, once we put it behind the caching layer, it's, it, you know, was doing what it needed to do. Wampi did a, a good amount of, um, <coughs> a good amount of performance optimization. Remember, he, he got the uh, cache clears the CCLs, um, our drush, our, our drush cache clears were taking an extremely long amount of time, like o over a minute, and uh, Wampi did some performance improvements. I don't know what he did. Yeah, that was feature-based. That was yeah. because we had so many different features. We were using <coughs> features to compartmentalize the site. It might, be a, similar, overriding it might be a similar issue, though. You know, I mean. Well, there. come talk to us, Joanna. We'd love to uh, yeah, get more in depth, and uh, we, we can certainly help with those types of problems. Mm -hmm. So next question. I was, uh, I was curious, obviously you guys have a pretty pretty big site. Um, all the pictures and the videos, are they s uh, hosted on the same place as your website or is it are they in a different location? Both. So, yeah, so they all go through, we, for all of the videos, we ingest not just the video, but any images that are associated with them and they're all stored locally in the, uh, in the website itself. But using Akamai, you know, we leverage that so that it's not going to be as much of a a slow hit to the site if you're pulling down, you know, high res images. Yeah, that's what I thought too. Yeah. Right, thanks. Mm -hmm. So, Mike, I hate to put you on the spot, 
but no, in don't. talking about performance improvements with the front end, versus, you, there was a point in time, I recall, at Lullabot where you were commenting on, wow, this thing's really slow, we've got to fix it. I just wondered if there was before and afters or stats that you recall that, was, that were worth noting, because I recall that being a, a good thing that you really achieved. <laughs> So with uh, with profiling the the painting and the, and the frames per second, it's really hard to get really straight uh, profile like accurate profiles. You can uh, there's like an FPS meter within Chrome, and uh, you can also use the uh, Chrome DevTools Timeline panel to measure that. But the problem is, as you as you're scrolling, you you're introducing the human element. You know how fast are you scrolling, and you know what's happening at that time. Um, so I, I had an attempt to automate that using jQuery Animate to kind of move that down. It wasn't working properly, and, and uh, James Sinsburn and I attempted to debug it. And I actually reached out to one of one of the uh, Chrome's developers on Twitter, Adi Asmani, who's, who's really well known and intelligent, who said it should be working properly, but it wasn't. So the long story short is I don't have any straight up um, stats. You know, I can I can probably show you some stuff, and there were some there were some instances where I was doing something and fighting myself one end or the other, and ended up fixing that. But uh, yeah, go ahead, Thomas. Yeah, so Thomas is asking about JavaScript op optimization. Um, so the trick of that is to limit li limit your recalculating of your style. So every time you're using like an offset or you're reca you're calculating something's position, your browser has to re re do a relayout. And when it does that, of course, you're you're taking up a lot of CPU time. And the problem is, is when that's done every single scroll event, it can really start bogging stuff down. So the trick is to group all those together and do them mm -hmm. as little as possible. So when you group them all together, your browser is smart enough to kind of kind of run it as one big operation, I guess, and get it done. So th there's a lot of that going on. And then in addition to that, it's um, you know not doing simple things like not querying your your jQuery selectors within every single scroll. Make sure those are cached and, and things like that, which seem which are should be obvious, but just to make sure you're doing it properly. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a great site called uh, jsperf.com. It's it's uh it was made by Steve Souders, who was the formal former uh, chief performance engineer at Google. And what's really interesting about this is you can go in there and you can you can put in a method or or whatever you're, whatever you're trying to do. It'll it'll tell you a couple of different ways to do it, and it'll give you performance data on how to do it, uh, on, on which method is the most performant. So if you're if you're doing if if you're doing these operations on every single scroll, you can you can really optimize that by by switching switching methods. And, and some of the stuff that I looked at was um, one or two line code changes, but at the same time it saves a lot of CP, CPU power, which might not even make a difference on a computer like this, but like on my mom's Windows Millennium <laughs> machine or someone else's you know machine and you know whatever crappy machine they have. It will make a difference. We need more questions. <laughs> we we are over time. We were only supposed to go until twelve forty-five yesterday. For uh, sure, one more question would be great. Oh yeah, there's plenty of time for questions, but don't, don't feel like you have to stay out of respect. If you want to get up and go, that's fine. No, you have to stay. Oh. Mike will come and get you. So, quick question about working with outside design companies. Yes. Um, I have an outside design company. I work with a lot of Drupal developers and other developers. How do you pass files to ensure not pixel perfection, but getting close? Do you use build specs? Do they give you CSS prototypes? So it was really difficult, and you know, working code was awesome, but there was some very weird things. You know, a lot of one-off situations. You know, they built mm -hmm. us a, a living style guide through HTML, but looking at the living style guide, there were a l they built that after the fact. They built that. They, they built the mock-up. What they delivered to us is they delivered three HTML mockups that were partially responsive. They didn't go all the way down to mobile. They maybe went from tablet to wide. But, and they also delivered um, a lot of Photoshop mockups, which were very high fidelity. 
Uh, and they also delivered a couple mobile mock-ups. And yeah, and, and, and some tablet wireframes. Yeah. Um, yeah, we used we used Envision app. Are you familiar with Envision app? Yeah. Yeah, we, we used that. I mean, to answer your question, there were there were a lot of one-offs. The Living Style Guide would have been really helpful had it been followed, had it been created and and followed to during the design process. Mm -hmm. um, it's really important, like as a front-end developer, to be able to componentize your design. So. If if I'm creating if I'm creating a style, I want to write that CSS once and then apply it in multiple places, as opposed to creating little little variations of CSS. And it it, it kind of became in the middle of it. This project did. Um, does that answer your question, or was I rambling? Yeah, no, I think that's cool. good. I, we just so many people do it different ways. There's Pattern Lab. Yeah. There's Envision. Yeah. We do really specific build specs, but that takes forever. So yeah, just curious about how they do and it. And it's it's really important to be flexible, you know, mm -hmm. especially when you're doing w when you're doing stuff. Once you see it live within HTML mm -hmm. and as it's functioning, mm -hmm. things can change. You know, you might have a better idea. And both the front end developer needs to be very flexible, and a design agency needs to be flexible. And uh, once everything gets working together, like it's really really cool and magical. Any other questions? How big was the team? How long did it take? Sure. Um, so it's a great question. Uh, and this is a, it was a fairly interesting project. Uh, we um, started out with a team of three. Uh, and then as we got closer and closer and, and worked deeper and deeper into the timeline and started to realize that we weren't going to hit our marks, um, we, we decided to sort of test uh, the limits of um, the uh, mythical man month Brooks Law um, paradigm of adding more developers to a project late in the game actually usually is results in a net slowdown is sort of the principle behind Brooks Law. And because we were using Drupal, because we had some fairly smart Drupal programmers uh, who had done a lot of work within the NBC world and the NBC universe, and NBC is all, they all use something called Publisher 7 uh, which is a distribution of Drupal, because of those factors, we actually ended up doing sort of a holiday surge. Um, MSNBC, one of our wonderful clients, had kind of slowed down over the Christmas holidays, and, and so we basically pulled that whole MSNBC team onto this sci-fi project, and s much to my surprise as the project manager and relief, we were actually able to see some real gains um, in, and get finished by our deadline uh, and I, I think primarily we have Drupal, Publisher 7, and sort of the consistency within the NBC uh, ecosystem to, to thank for that. Um, pulling people from MSNBC on to sci-fi actually turned out to, uh, you know, work. Who knew? <laughs> so, you know, like Petraeus with the surge, everyone was very dubious, but uh, the surge worked and we were able to hit our, hit our timeline. Thank God. We had, we had uh, 11 at one point all collaborating. Yeah, together. we went from a team of three uh, over the holidays up to a team of 11. Yeah, so, and then back down again. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank Cheers. you. And if you guys have any questions for us, stop by, hang out, and uh, party tonight at uh, oh, Hotel, yeah, Hotel Figueroa. Party. Ain't no party like a lullaby Sorry, that's party. a great point. Uh, lullaby party tonight at 7 o'clock at the Hotel Figueroa.